Welcome again to the West Valley Center for Spiritual Living, our Facebook Live broadcast of our Sunday service and how absolutely amazing it is to um, know that we are joined in this beautiful and soulful way. And so I'll begin with just a, a short invocation to sort of uh, hunker down and get us all connected in that great, powerful way we know through the words of prayer. Mm, just speaking a word of blessing for this time, for this amazing way we can be together even as we are sitting in separate places. For this way that reminds us that right where we are, God is, and that spirit itself, this infinite uh, 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 wisdom of all the universe is never missing or lacking or limited or blinking or or stuttering in any way. This pure essence of God of goodness is flowing right now, creating for us the perfect Sunday morning service experience. I say thank you, God. How grateful I am to know the way in which we gather is truly in God, and we let it be, and so it is. Amen. Oh my goodness, here we are on another Sunday morning, and I, I have, it seems like a lot to say this morning, so I'd like to jump right in. Um, I want to talk to you today about a theme that I have entitled, Stamp of Approval. And this whole idea of a, of a stamp of approval has to do with the way that we sort of uh, recognize in life the beliefs that we stand under and follow and believe. And I was reading in uh, Ernest Holmes' wonderful book called A New Design for Living, and I found this quote. And when I read this quote months ago, I thought this must be um, a, a topic for conversation on a Sunday morning, and little did I know that it would be even more relevant as we live um, somewhat isolated still and, and in this shared experience of, of, a, of a pandemic. And so uh, let me read to you the quote. Um, I'm sorry, it's really hard to talk to yourself when messages come up. There's some message, Julie, you might want to check just to make sure we're all okay still. So here's the quote from Dr. Holmes. He said that some time may elapse before science is able to confirm our conviction that thought has a definite bearing on the nature of our experience in all our affairs and in our contact with each other. So he's talking about the way we think, how it has a clear cut impact on all of our relationships and all the situations and the way we move through the affairs or details of our own individual lives. But we do not need to wait for science to place its stamp of approval on this theory we can prove it for ourselves and we are proving it every day oh my goodness that's that's a pretty powerful statement that there is certain things that we learn from the world of science that gives us credibility to stand upon and sort of then build our own understanding and relationship with things especially right now where we have this sort of foreign, different experience. None of us have, have lived through an experience quite like this. And yet, all of us are doing that together right now. So what's unique about that is it tells me that because of this idea of being isolated or sequestered in our own homes, that we have been left alone for a long time now with our own thoughts. And so it's a refreshing opportunity for us to examine what kinds of beliefs and opinions and, and theories that we're creating in our very own minds as we're moving through this situation. So here's what I notice in my own life. And it's not just because I'm a minister, it's because it's the nature of me. I love having a job where I get I get paid to do research and to stay current in things and to deepen my own view and then share it with you. How cool is that? Um, and, and not in a setting where you get to respond. I really get to tell you everything I think and believe in, a, in, a, in one fell swoop. 
So what I notice for myself always is that I'm hungry for information. And what that means right now is that I'm hungry for information that will help me make sense out of this condition that the entire world is moving through. And so I have been sifting through a lot of information, just like you, um, maybe a little more than most of you, but I have been sifting through a powerful amount of information in order to come to some sort of a solid foundation in my own understanding of where I'm at just for now, because you know, tomorrow it changes. But we are all sort of processing this information and as we are processing it, or even looking for information to explore, I notice that I have to find it in sort of a, a languaging that I can relate to, right? Uh, there's gonna be a perspective that I'm needing in order to pull in more information to help me make sense of all this newness that's happening on the planet right now. So, I was thinking about how when you make a phone call, especially if you're going to call a, a business and you need a little assistance from somebody on the other end of the phone, that, that often now we get recordings. So that somebody will pick up the phone and say, hello, uh, or no, that, that you've reached the, you know, whatever organization. And then they say something to the effect of, um, if you would like to hear this recording in Spanish, please press one. You know, it's something like para misio um, 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 numero uno. I don't know. In, in, I don't know. I don't speak Spanish. Can you tell? You'll probably inform me better how to say that. But it seems to me you hear that all the time, right? So you got to find the language in which you can best hear the information that you need or have an exchange with somebody. So in that same way, we're kind of always looking for people that are are thinking similar to what we think. It's how churches came to be, right? It's why we have so many religions. We're looking to speak spirituality in a language that other people can, can hear us and understand us and we can relate to each other. And so, you know, we, we have that. And therefore, I was thinking how I'm really choosy about information that I select to um, educate me on this pandemic situation. I'm very choosy. You know, I start watching a podcast or a, a YouTube, and there's something that's um, sort of end of the worldish or fatalistic or something that leaves me in the dark or doesn't provide much hope or, or is really scary. You know, there's a lot of, if we don't do this, we're all going to die. Then I, I don't listen to that because I know that's not my language. Can you begin to hear what I'm talking about here? that I need to hear, if I'm going to be open-minded, I have to find things stated in a way that doesn't cause me to close that door. Because I've, I've been there. So it's more like this. This is, what I th this is what I was thinking. This We can think of it like this. It's more like we're looking for information, and then we get a little recording that says, um, if you are looking for a scientific point of view on the pandemic, press 1. If you would like a spiritual perspective, press two. If you're really looking for conspiracy theory, press three. And there you tap into whatever it is that's in a language that satisfies you in one way or another. Now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how I um, became sensitive to fear-based teachings. And I happen to have as a young woman a um, a spiritual teaching, a religion that was so perfect for me at that time. Oh my goodness, it was perfect in every way and gave me this spiritual community I had never experienced before. But it was a bit, um, it was a bit apocalyptic. And so there was this quandary of living, knowing, uh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up this way. This was not a naive thing I learned as a child and, and didn't know how to get out of. I like chose this religion as an adult. Um, so I'm living in this quandary of, of a faith, a religious faith that is, is got you ready for the end of the world at any moment. But at the same time, even though there's that terrifying factor, 
there's also this sweet and 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 big comforting aspect of it so it was like always finding your balance in between the the middle of that and come on you know what i know i love kettle corn because it's both sweet and savory right so there is some kind of a, a way that there's tension that that create we find a balance in the tension almost like a tight rope that can be pulled tautly so that we can walk across that so in my years of being connected there what what occurred for me was that i became very sensitive to fear-based teachings and when i grew up and, and made a decision to um, leave that philosophy and sort of broaden my options then that training I had in, in recognizing fear-based teachings really has served me. So I'm quick to change the channel. If it doesn't have hope, if it seems gloom and doom, I'm out. I need something that will uplift me at the same time as I'm gathering information. And I also want it to be intelligent. I'm not looking to be you know, brainwashed or attracted to uh, something really out there and just find enough information to establish a, a, enough of a foundation that I can think I have all the truth. Part of, of having uh, more, and most adults this age, have had more than one spiritual experience. We've, we've played or dabbled in different spiritual beliefs, and I think that gives us then the broader and stronger uh, foundation. In terms of a spiritual view, the question is, for me now, how can I process all of this information around the virus? How is it possible, and I think it is, but how can I process it without needing to find a bad guy, some evil force to blame everything I don't understand on? Because what we know, and I've been saying this lately, so I just want to remind us again, um, when I focus all my energy on who to blame, I now have lost my center of balance because I'm believing and enforcing the belief that there is evil outside of me that can, can bring harm to me or can impact my life in a, in a negative way. So every time I blame anything outside of me, I lose my power. And that's not something we want to want we want to do. I don't want to give my power away anymore, and neither do you. So we're having this chat this morning about about all of this. I, I want to remind you that I have my opinions, and so do you. I have things that trigger me. I have I would I would really be open minded enough to say that there are areas where I have strong judgments about things. And this spiritual path for me is not trying to, um, s s you know, stomp them away. Not, it's not trying to rid myself of all my judgments. What I really am looking at doing is finding a greater sense of flexibility in the way that I view life. Sort of our annual theme this year. What do I see today? And how can I open myself to see things differently no matter what? So don't be, this talk is not to say don't be opinionless, and this talk is not to say conspiracy theories are bad. Hey, I have some, cons I, there are, I'm just going to say, there are a couple of attractive theories right now that have my attention, but I'm, I'm choosy into how I uh, relate or what relationship I want to have with those ideas. So it's sort of, for me, like um, kids at play. When I was a kid, I grew up in the, uh, when I lived in Glendora, California, and uh, in the 50s, and there were so many children on the street. I grew up with all these great other families and lots of kids. There was always somebody to play with and lots going on all the time. And we played, even the girls were invited to play games with some of the neighborhood kids, the other guys as well, um, we, we played games like um, Cowboys and Indians. We played games like um, Cops and Robbers. And what I remember is that there were times where you got to choose. Would you be a cop or would you be a robber? 
And then there were other days where there was somebody who, whoever had the idea that we should be playing this game, where that person would assign you a job, and then it was still fun because you got to put on a, a, a character, and you got to step into um, playing like you were either a, a villain or a hero. Now, as we have grown and as we have moved into the 21st century, what we have realized, even people who are not spiritually grounded, we have realized that there's not so easy to tell who the good guys and the bad guys are if you just look alone at cops and robbers. What we have come to understand is that all of us are human beings. And so there are good traits and there are not so good traits that all of us bring to play when we are interacting with each other. And so I could be, you know, holy about it and ministerial about it and say, oh, from, from God's view, there are no, there is no bad. You know, it's not like God's up there judging who, I mean, I, I know in some religious perspectives, um, this is hard to hear, but um, in my uh, current um, spiritual beliefs and foundation, I don't believe in a God that judges us good or bad. I rather see that everything in the universe is working to give us an opportunity to have an experience of life and to do our own research and to determine what it is that we will put our stamp of approval on. So these are things to think about. As we embody an idea or a belief or a philosophy, we are indeed putting our, our symbolically a stamp of approval on those ideas. And we need to remember that we don't have to carry those ideas around forever, that we are always open to choice and to being able to change our minds. So in the same way that as a child we played uh, cowboys and Indians, and, and we grow to see that, that, that there are no villains and, or heroes that it's, it's significantly attached to one group or the other, that all of us are all of those things. Now, the gift and the opportunity is, especially now, as we've had time to be more quiet and think about such things, is that there really isn't that much difference between a Russian and an American. You know, if you look at our humanity, in the same way the astronauts were in space and had this profound impact of not seeing borders between countries. You know, there's, there is, if we look at the humanity of us, there is not that much difference between a, a left view or a right view, politically speaking. Now, in our humanity, there's a tremendous divide. But in our spiritual um, objective of, of wholeness and seeing humanity as a whole, it becomes trickier to, to uh, keep that divide in place. And I thought, this is an important discussion for another reason. We are doing a lot of fixing up and remodeling here in this building. And um, as I've been speaking to you, we will have the, the building painted. I'm really, um, I'm going to affirm we're going to get this building painted by the end of the month. It may take a little longer because we're at the mercy of the city. I'm not going to have an opinion about that because I don't want my energy to slow anything down in that process. But what I'm going to suggest is that we're going to be divided as to whether or, we, or not we, we like the choices of the color. And I, I just want to say that let's, um, let's stand in the, in the beauty of the bigger picture, that we are just cleaning things up from the inside to the outside and all around us, creating a brand new space for us to meet together again and eventually in, in a brand new world, in a brand new time in the history of the world. So I rejoice in, in realizing that some of my worst choices in life have also contributed to the best pieces of growth and, and wisdom that I've acquired in my life. I want to tell you a personal story. I, I, I think this is a perfect um, story, and I, but I would like you to hear this story, um, not just from my perspective, but in the way that my story will represent some stories in your own life, some of your own experiences. So be thinking while I'm telling the story of your own encounters 
that are similar to this. I was still in my 20s. We were living in Arkansas. I had four small children. And I had gone to work at um, an agency called the Ozark Guidance Center. And it was a nonprofit organization that um, did uh, a mental health work. That, that we offered um, um, psychological services on a, on a sliding fee scale. And it was a really cool job and I loved it. And all of my colleagues, all of my friends, everybody I worked with, they were all therapists or psychiatrists. And so I was like the office manager, you know, I was the receptionist and I was the transcriptionist and I, I did all the office stuff. And I was very fond of everybody I worked with. They were really, I can tell you to this day, I would say they were all really good people and I was blessed to have those encounters. One day we were having lunch and one of the therapists I was having lunch with, I considered her a very good friend and she revealed to me something I had not known about her. And that was that her partner was a woman. And suddenly, on hearing that information, I was faced with a huge dilemma because I belonged to a religious faith that did not condone homosexuality and in fact would never allow me to have a friend that was a lesbian. Now, that was in my face. And this dilemma threw me into the greatest existential shift I have probably ever experienced in my life because she was already my friend and I already loved her. And I could not turn my back on that person because of a choice or a, or, 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 or a, or a lifestyle and because of a religion that told me that God abhorred that. And my dilemma was big because what it meant was that I had believed everything I had been told in that faith and I had been very comfortable living in that philosophy until this moment where I realized I had not been making choices that were my choices. I was looking for a stamp of approval from an organization that was telling me. And I had been willing up to that point to follow all the rules, which I didn't even see as rules. I thought it was truth. And I thought it was the whole truth. And I thought that we were the only truth. So I, I, it says we're not playing the video right now. Um, shall I just continue? Sorry, we're having trouble playing the video. Continue. All right, so I'm going to continue and assume. Um, so if you don't hear the end of this story, you're definitely going to want to hear the, um, the end of this story. Oh, good. Sounds like you're hearing me. Good. I'm going to continue. So um, um, what happened was the dilemma altered the entire direction of my life. Have you had moments of awakening like that? Have you had those moments uh, on, along that journey? It is a journey without distance. It is a return to love. It is, it is what happens in the, in the experience itself. And I began asking myself questions. You know, questions like, what, what is true here and, and what is not true here and what do I believe? What do I, as a woman, me, Karen, what do I actually believe if I wasn't being told what to believe? And the biggest question of all was this, what the hell do I do next? Because that was a pretty important decision. And I will say to you that it didn't I didn't have a resolution that was easy. It took me two or three years and a lot of counseling before I was able to, to um, really get comfortable in the new direction that my life was heading in, which ultimately gave me more freedom than I had ever imagined. So the reason I'm telling you this story is because I sense that there's something similar occurring now that there's something going on in the way that we are having to make decisions as we show up with each other. We are creating our own stories right now. 
we are in the same way that I always encourage us to find what our own personal theology is. What do we believe about God? Not what does somebody tell me to believe about God, but what do I believe about God? In that same way, we are now creating a story about what this pandemic means to us individually, collectively, and basically, you know, bottom line, globally. So I have three tips for you. My first tip in, in, and this is a philosophy that I'm following for myself now, I'm going to stay as open-minded as I can. As I move through all of this research that I am uh, um, sifting through, I'm gonna stay as open-minded as I can. Secondly, I know I'm gonna continue gathering information. I am not looking for a single truth that tells me I now have it all figured out because we don't have all the information about the virus even the scientists do not have all that information. And thirdly, I'm going to pay attention to my judgments. And yes, I'm going to call them judgments, my opinions, or the ways in which I get triggered as I'm watching other people's reactions to what should happen next. Now, we're in a position in the state of Arizona where many of the restrictions have been lifted and we have a lot of opinions around what it needs to look like as we re-enter into the world. And what we have done is we have gathered our information and we have put our stamp of approval on the opinions that matter most to us. And we are living our life as honestly as, I can, as we can, in our own integrity, as much as we can, with our own opinions, but I am sensing that some of those opinions are beginning to divide us. And so I'm thinking about it like this. It's as if we're in the world and we have gathered information and now we have some new ideas and these are our newborn ideas because we have never had to think this way before. And in our newborn ideas, we are, uh, are protecting them. We have swaddled our ideas. The things we think that we can hang on to the most, we have swaddled and we are protecting it. And in the same way, we would protect any newborn uh, little sweet thing in our life. And I'm not suggesting we have to change our beliefs, but I am inviting all of us to be sure that we continue to grow and that as we grow, we take these newborn ideas and we practice love and kindness in the ways we are beginning to connect again. So I wanna talk about specifics. Um, first of all, you know, I give you permission to know, cause like me, you've already made up your mind about a lot of these things that I'm gonna talk about. And I just say them so that we can see that it's really a big broad list of things that we've been looking at. We may not even realize that we've made these opinions or put our stamp of approval on things already. As the restrictions are lifted, they are opening in the Phoenix area, uh, certain restaurants and they're looking to practice um, social distancing. And what I notice is that many people are offended by that and that other people are really thrilled to be getting out of the house again. I notice that people are making decisions to revisit the, the hair salon. Uh, people are really eager to get back to the gym. As soon as the gym's open, they want to get back there or to have your, your, your massage, go to your, visit your spa again, whatever your, your pleasure is. I also notice that we don't completely agree on, on the um, idea of face masks. And I notice that that seems to be a strong place of um, opinion because it appears that there's enough evidence that we should all agree in this way and then there's another group of people that really isn't ever going to be able to come close to agreeing with that opinion. So for those people who don't want to wear face masks, they're just not going to places like Costco where it's required to wear a face mask. But there are other conversations like, does that mean I should wear a face mask while I'm taking my walk? Does it mean I should wear a face mask while I'm driving in my car? 
And there are people who in my life have very strong and quick answers to those things. Is it okay to hug my grandchildren? Can we travel? And if you are able to answer any of those things really, really quickly, I would say just notice that you've put your stamp of approval on whatever your beliefs are. And you can back them up because you've done your research because you pressed one or two or three or what, whatever your language is, right? So we speak different languages here and we're coming up mm -hmm. with different ideas. And what I notice when I'm feeling passionate about something, you know, if I'm using a rubber stamp and I'm really passionate about it, if I get too much ink on that stamp, then when I put it down on the paper, the ink starts to run, right? The ink will bleed. And I think that that's a really good analogy that it would be sweet for us not to put our stamp too hard down on life and in our statements and our opinions because we'll start bleeding all over each other and creating new ways to have differences. If we have not learned anything from isolating, I think it's that we want to heal the differences. And so we want to walk very delicately into this new world. We want to carry our sweet opinions and our, our new research and we want to carry it gingerly and tenderly and, and not feel like it's, 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 the, it's the only truth that, that there is and we want to be open to change our minds should we get more information and be able to do that. I also think we want to realize, it's, it's helpful to realize not everybody can wear a face mask and there are reasons for that. And not everybody is wearing a mask because they're scared. We're not because they're scared of getting the virus, not even because they're scared of giving the, passing on the virus, but because it seems a smart thing to do. So we can't be quick to judge. We don't have anybody else's research. We can only have our own. And so here's, here's something I've been thinking about. Just let us, you know, this is part of my prayer every day, let us be open to know that our neighbors have different opinions than we do. They have a different stamp of approval. That our family members have different ideas than we do. I'm hearing a lot of conversation about people who are worried about the decisions their adult children are making. Can we love them? Can we practice loving them and, and practice compassion and kindness and and um, my screen has gone blank now. Is that a problem? Camera seems to be still on. Um, can, we, can we take all of that and throw it in a basket and, and just um, um, still do really good things with our lives? So the bottom line is I want to tell you um, some of the, the, the ways we can look at how we're doing things differently is to ask ourselves, how can I be love? You know, how can I express love in more ways than I ever used to? How can I, here is a really good question that came up for me. How can I trust in a power that's greater than I am when I don't feel safe out in the world? And how can I feel safe while people around me seem to be making decisions that I don't feel safe in? And I would say to you that uh, the, the greatest gift we could give ourselves right now is to not give up on the, on the newness that's being born onto the planet, the, the brand new uh, way of thinking that is emerging on this planet. Let's not be quick to go back to the old ways we used to answer those questions, all of our old ideas. Let's toss some of that out and let's look for new ways to respond, even as there are, are new ideas that are, that are forming. And so I'm, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for and I'm asking and I'm practicing in my own life that we continue to expand and be open to the new consciousness that is trying to be born, the new mentality, the new way of seeing life through our own eyes with our own, with our own vision. And please, while you are practicing holy newness in this profound way, practice listening within to your own inner wisdom because it's possible 
that when you look and see there are people that are not wearing masks and it makes you uncomfortable, maybe the message is for you to stay safe inside the house. Maybe you're not ready to go out and maybe it's the great inner wisdom of your being telling you, you need to be safe. Just don't go out, you know, stay in as much as you can. And that's, that would be the gift if we could all practice listening to that intuition right now, we would see a tremendous shift to good, to love, to compassion, to kindness. I, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I have never felt uh, a greater need to, to love you know, I do these Zoom calls and I just love you so much as I'm looking at you. I have never ached to, to hug you more than I ache to hug you right now. I, my fingers are, are deprived of touch, you know, and I, I live with another human being. Many of you are isolated and you don't have any opportunity to touch. But I can tell you how much I know I'm craving it right now. And so I would say that... that that nature is brilliant and she has given us other ways to be fulfilled in the way that we love each other. I can tell you that I sense that when I go out and I take my walk. Even as I walk here at church and I go out to get the mail and I notice that, oh my gosh, look at the color and the, the trees. It's like, what's happened? It's like I've had cataracts removed and I can see this brilliant color or I'm taking my walk in my familiar neighborhood and I see the trees that are now shaped differently because they're full of, of leaves and the cactus are blooming and the, the sounds of the birds singing. All of it is a, a deeper expression of love. And the reason we can have those experiences is because we have, we have negotiated with the universe to a higher stamp of approval as to what reality, what we, we will accept as reality in our very own lives. And so when I can see goodness, when I can recognize beauty, that's a good place to be. You know, I, I heard this week, and sadly I don't remember who said it. It was a fabulous quote um, on a podcast where someone said, you know, we've been confused. We have thought that love is a thing. You know, and I'm thinking in the same way that we have thought God is a thing. But God is not a thing. God is not an, an entity. God is not human-like in its features. God is much greater than all of those things, and so is love. Remember, there's that profound scripture, God is love. And so love is not a thing. It's not something you can go after. It's not something you can create and make. You can be kind. You can do nice things. You can intend to be loving. But love is an experience. And so whoever this author was said, said it's beauty. It is beauty. It is opening. And I've been saying this for so long. It excites me. It is when we open ourselves to an experience of beauty, that's love. And so I would take that a step further and say to you, when you have an experience of beauty resonating within you, that's God. That's love and that's God and it's truth. And we don't need science to confirm that. That's not a theory. That's a truth that you can perceive and, and realize. I don't need anybody to agree with me on any of that because that's my reality. I know that's my truth. And that's where I desire to leave us today. So I have found a beautiful reading that I want to close with this morning. It comes from a book called Pronoia by Rob Bresney. I bought this book in 1999. Um, and the, the word pro, pronoia is the opposite of paranoia. And he loosely defines that by saying it's the way we can see that the whole world is conspire, conspiring to shower us with blessings. He says the whole universe conspires to shower us with blessings. That is the philosophy I live by. But I would like to read you this gorgeous, gorgeous poem and... Um, it is a small extraction of a much longer writing, and it, um, it is already, uh, I already sent it to the woman, Kay Fontana, who graciously puts this stuff on our newsletter each week, so you can find it there. 
but listen to these words written in 1999 that sound like they are written about this pandemic experience we are going through. As heaven and earth come together, as the dream time and the daytime merge, we register the exhilarating fact that we are in charge of creating a brand new world. Not in some distant time, not in some faraway place, but right here and right now. We stand on, on this brink, we dance on this verge, this new world we're gestating, ready to emerge. I'm curious, my fellow creators, since you and I are in charge of making a new world, not just breaking apart the old world, where do we begin? What stories do we want at the heart of our experiments? What questions will be our oracles? And here is what I say. We will ignore the cult of gloom and doom. We will em embrace the cause of Zoom and boom. N new meaning with Zoom being such an important part of our lives. We will laugh at the stupidity of evil and hate, and we will summon the brilliance of praise to create. No matter how upside down it appears, we will have no fears because we know this secret. Life is crazily in love with us, wildly and innocently in love with us. We are always given exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. I am not exaggerating, I am not indulging in poetic metaphor when I tell you that we are already living in paradise the sweet stuff that quenches all our longing is here now with this new pair of eyes. And I believe this reading sums up everything I desired to say to you this morning. And so we'll just anchor this in prayer. Get comfortable wherever you are seated. Notice what little gem is yours to grab that you will carry through this week and deepen in your understanding before you grab for the ink and put your, your stamp of approval. Just feel the love of God within you even now. Feel the love of God. Recognize that there is only one mind it is that divine mind, and it is my mind right now, and it is the mind of every person listening to the words of this prayer. And as we align ourselves to this higher truth, to this wisdom, to this divine guidance that carries us, that directs us, that protects us, as we move through these days of a, of a condition, a worldwide condition, we are anchored in this glorious truth that we do not need the approval of science, that we do not need the approval of our neighbors or our families, that there is this divine wisdom within us, that there is a wisdom and intuition that we tap into even now, that there is a healing going on in our physical be being, and it is the same healing that is going on in the transformation process of this planet. And so I know that there is a revealing of greater truths. There is a wholeness and a perfection, a holistic experience of this organic thing called life, this divine life. And we open ourselves to, to receive that guidance, to receive that influx of wisdom, that grace of God that stirs us to know that we carry within us always the indwelling presence of God. And for this, I am eternally grateful. I say, thank you, God. Thank you, life. And I release the words of this prayer into the law, knowing that it is indeed already done. I place my stamp of approval as I say the words, amen, amen. And together we say, and so it is. Whew, don't forget your, oh, give me a minute. <laughs> Oh, I have no announcements. Uh, it's time for our offering. I bless this offering. There will be someone out front if you desire to come to church and and deliver your offering in present, present in in person. I love you. I love you. Thank you for tuning in.
That's all for today.